Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain. And today we're going to talk about the cicadas that everyone is anticipating and also what we can do out in the yard now that it's officially planting season. So as always, we've got our panelists here to get your questions answered and give some great advice. So let's have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty and where you can find them outside. So Jen, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist and you can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. I'm pretty well a generalist of any kind of hort questions, but my favorite topics are home vegetable gardening and houseplants, um, if I had to pick two. All right, awesome. And Chris, go ahead. Hello, my name is Chris Enroth. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension and uh, you can find me online. I uh, Myself with a couple of colleagues, we write the Good Growing blog and we have the Good Growing podcast, which we post weekly episodes and post uh, every single week. So yeah, check us out at Good Growing. I like that you guys are, it's a lifestyle, right? It's not just work, like there are segments where it's a lifestyle. And then if there's any time left, you go outside and you plant stuff in your own yard. So, well, welcome and thank you so much. So as always, we start with show and tells and uh, Jen, we'll start with you. What did you bring us today? Um, we noticed last week, uh, just randomly looking out my kitchen window, we finally had hummingbirds and I had forgotten to put the feeders out. Usually I want to put them out earlier. So I got them up this weekend and I just want to remind people that it's been pretty chilly the last few nights and, uh, hummingbirds need that sustenance. So get your feeders out. Uh, this one has the glass is actually tinted red. You do not have to color the um, sugar water red. It's actually advisable to not do that, but it's the ratio is a cup of sugar to four cups of water. And I usually have to warm the water up a little bit to get all that sugar to dissolve readily. Put it in your feeder and make sure you change it every few days. When it's chilly out, it lasts a little longer, but it, you, when it gets hot out, you wanna make sure you're changing it regularly so that it doesn't um, start to ferment and grow mold that can be harmful for the birds. But they, at nighttime, they go into a state called torpor, which is almost like hibernation. So they almost die overnight. And when it's low in the 30s and stuff, that's pretty chilly for them. So uh, they've been clustered around my feeder this weekend when we had some lows in the 30s. So uh, do get those out if, you, if you're a hummingbird uh, person that likes to feed them. And you've talked about the color red before and not putting dye or not using anything to color that. Can you talk a little bit more about why the feeders are red and, and sort of where the, the, the red came from? Well, I can tell you my son um, was educating me this morning. He said that they can only see red. I, I, have, I have not fact-checked my eight-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> he, he told me he learned it on Wildcats, which is a PBS show. Um, so uh, I... I trust that they they fact check themselves, but he said they can only see red. So, and there's not a whole lot blooming right now this time of year, and they have incredibly fast metabolisms. Mm -hmm. So, to like supplement them and keep them happy as it's still a little chilly this time of year, we love watching them and okay. uh, love encouraging them in our yard. Awesome! Thank you so much, Jen. All right, Chris, what do you got? Well, I have some tomato plants to show you, and it's kind of a difference of things. And so these tomato plants, they were uh, all grown from seed. So I started these, oh, it was about the last week of March. Um, and so we put them in some six packs. My camera doesn't blur it out here. So we have some tomatoes in six packs right here. And um, then we had once, after about a few weeks, we then potted them up into larger containers here like this. So, you know, it's about a six inch container. And kind of the reason why we do this is because in the six packs, there's only a finite volume of soil for these to, uh, to, to have uh, nutrients and water and so on. So uh, potting them up into a larger container gives them more space because, uh, under those grow lights uh, in this six pack, you know, there is, there's, there's a lot of competition happening. And uh, the, so the tomatoes, you can see they're kind of slanted in their growth pattern. So you can tell who is closest to the light, who is kind of growing a little bit faster and kind of as they're sitting next to me on, on the desk here, you can only see the top of the one that I potted up because the others are still pretty small, still pretty stunted because they're just so crowded together. Now in that vein though, I think with extension, and we always mention to people, just because you see a tall tomato does not necessarily mean that is that is the healthiest and the best tomato to get. Sometimes that means that tomato also is, is stretched, meaning it didn't get enough light. 
And so, you know, sometimes when you're at the nursery picking out a tomato transplant for yourself, uh, if you have to choose between a tall, leggy tomato and maybe a short, more compact tomato, uh, you might go for the more compact one, uh, pr provided that they, they look healthy. So, you know, if you had to choose between two healthy plants, one's a little bit taller and leggy, one's a bit stouter, I'd go with the stouter tomato. But we can always take these tall tomatoes and put them, bury them a little bit deeper in the ground because the stems will send out adventitious roots. And so that's kind of the beauty about tomatoes. You, you can have tall, leggy stems and they'll be okay. Now, can you talk a little bit more about when you know it's time to get them out of that cell pack and into their own spot? Do you go by true leaves? What's your method or what is the method? And I'd like to hear from both of you actually on this one. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and sometimes it's kind of up to the gardener, but for the most part, we're looking for when we see those true leaves begin to emerge. So as the tomato seed germinates, it sends up what's called the seed leaves. And so for tomato, it's a dicot, which means two leaves, you know, dicot, cot leaf, two leaves. So it's gonna send up those two leaves. They don't look anything like these tomato leaves that I have in front of me right here. Uh, those are the leaves that are inside the seed, which I thought was fascinating when I learned about that in uh, horticulture at school. But, um, but then you start to see the true leaves emerge, which look like these actual tomato leaves. And once I see those and they expand, they get a little bit to size. So maybe a few weeks, maybe one week or two, that's when I will pot them up into a larger pot here and, and give them that space that they need. And so this is not being crowded underneath the lights, my, my one that's potted up in this bigger container. It's got its own room, it's got its own space, and it's pretty happy right now. Cool. And Jen, I, mm -hmm. you've talked a lot on the show about how you grow yours on countertops and kind of like in the house everywhere. So, you know, how do you know when it's time to get them out of that cell pack? And is it different if you're growing them for countertop tomatoes? And what's your method? Uh, I'm, I'm still growing them under grow lights. Uh, and I think as you um, gain an experience, like you can look at this at the leaves, like Chris was talking about, but I'll also sometimes pop them out of the cell pack and look at how, how much root development there is. Because mm -hmm. one thing that I have experienced is that you may plan for X number of flats. And if the, everyone wants to plant stuff super early, right in January, they're asking questions about planting. And if you were to start tomatoes in January, which you could, I guess, but you've got to make sure you have the space to keep potting up like Chris is showing. I have fallen into that uh, trap before of having a little more, um, my eyes are bigger than the available space <laughs> kind of thing. And you'll just have a, a less quality plant. If you keep it in that cell pack too long, they, they're just going to exhaust all the available available nutrition, you're going to be watering them two or three times a day because they'll just be using up mm -hmm. all the moisture so quickly. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I've, I've looked at both the roots and the leaves, but then over time you kind of get an eye for, oh yeah, that's about time. Or mm -hmm. I plant my stuff later so that I don't have to go through that repotting phase. So I'm just acclimating them to outside and putting them right in the ground mm -hmm. or in my containers. And you know, I've, speaking of starting things early you know we i think we've all done that and i when you're using fertilizer with them as well and it's like oh man i don't have a i don't have a lot of time <laughs> left on these soil packs because they're going to explode if i don't get these guys out of here soon so but i like that you both use different methods i like that you use roots and leaves and kind of you know i the experience that you gain you know a lot of people get so banana shape on the textbook way to do things. And that, that's why I ask a lot of you to expound on different things, because I like to hear a variety of answers and what works for you. So thank you for that. Um, Jen, you've got another show and tell or another couple show and tells. Sure, yeah, I, I've got another bird show and tell. So it is time and I have a question for the viewers. So this is my Oriole feeder and it's Ooh. got a dish of grape jelly, just regular old grape jelly. That's pretty. And, and oranges. Yeah, this has worked really, really well for us. Um, and I don't have as many Orioles so far this year, but I've, I've had some. I had an Oriole on my hummingbird feeder this morning. That was a first. I've got a lot of birds going where I don't expect them to go. Uh, the question I have for viewers is I have been, I thought I just must have had a mess of Orioles eating the grape jelly. And then I looked out and I had just probably four or five house finches eating the grape jelly. And I've never seen that before. And I asked a friend in Decatur, which is about 25 miles west of where I live, and they had seen it too. 
uh, I asked my uncle who lives in Naperville, up by the Chicago area, and he, he's seen Orioles and hummingbirds, but no house finches at his, um, at his grape jelly and oranges. So I don't know, just curious. Interesting. If it's not something I've seen before. All right, we'll have to see what, uh, what people say. Leave us a, a comment on Facebook, uh, folks, and let us know what you've seen eating the grape jelly at your place. <laughs> do you have one more, Jen, or do you want to? I do have one more. Um, yeah, let's see it. This is just kind of a random if we're growing greens. This is a great time of growing lettuce and other greens in the spring. Um, I've been growing some kale, and I, I'll be honest, I sat down at the computer, and I really wanted to munch on something salty. And we just got an air fryer. We upgraded from a little teeny tiny one. And so I made I made kale chips um, this mm. afternoon with uh, some kale that we grew here at home. And so just a DIY, if you want a little bit of a healthier, healthier salty snack, uh, just give them a light coating of olive oil. And I did four minutes at 375 with a little salt and I've got my salty snack. They are. I, I haven't made them. I've had them, but now uh, you make me want to try them. Chris, have you made your own kale chips? Oh, you better believe it. I don't I don't know what it is about kale, but if I was a child and you tried to feed that to me, I'd hate it. But as an adult, <laughs> they're delicious. It is. My you can son do so much with it. Side eye. My son is just like, you're crazy, but okay. <laughs> well, my mom, it's like, it depends on the generation because to my mom, it's a garnish. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we don't eat kale, you know, you put kale very nicely on the salad bar around everything else, you know? So it's weird how some people view kale as like a delicious snack and others are like, no, thank you. <laughs> Just depends on where you fall. So, okay, we've got some viewer questions that have come in. Um, and Chris, we'll start with you. This is question number 15, DJ, um, from Carly. And for those that like to grow potatoes like I do, how do you find space to keep the rotation on a three-year schedule? So that's the first question. Uh, they're trying to put in new raised beds and want to put the potatoes in, but don't know where to put them after that three years. Quite the challenge as growing in containers has never worked. So a long, um, a, a spot for potatoes that will last. Uh, Chris, what do you think? Yeah, so potatoes, they're in the same family, at, or sorry, potatoes, yes, they're in the same family as tomatoes and peppers, eggplant. But the big difference with potatoes and the others that I mentioned is potatoes prefer cooler weather. So they like their roots kept a little bit cooler. Uh, tomatoes and peppers, obviously, they like the heat. That's why, you know, even though we would hopefully be planting our tomatoes by now, it's still chilly at night. So we're not. Uh, but potatoes are doing very well right now because the soil is staying cool. Uh, there's some nice moisture in the ground. So I, it's understanding that if you're trying to grow potatoes in a container, some of the issues that you might have. Now, now initially, as I mentioned, it could be the temperature. You know, if you're planting in a smaller container, and the sun is hitting that container and heating it up, it's really, I mean, the temperatures in those containers can get pretty hot, especially in the summer months. So, um, you know, larger containers uh, might work, uh, maybe containers that are a bit more porous that allow the air and water to evaporate, which cools it, but then it comes into the second problem, it dries it out. So making sure that you're consistent with your watering. Um, and as we get into the warmer days of summer, you might have to be watering that at least once a day, sometimes even twice a day. Uh, you know, I recommend if you can mulch over top, if you're gonna be growing in a container using something like wood chips. Um, so, but again, being in the same family as tomatoes and peppers, potatoes have their own series of disease and that's why we wanna rotate them around the garden. And so having a raised bed, while yes, it's beneficial, it might, minimize some of the other locations you could plant. So if you could divide your raised bed into thirds, potentially, uh, and then plant every third, and you would get a three-year rotation with that. Now, ideally, you would love to see a four-year rotation, but if you can only do three-year rotation, that's okay. Um, and maybe throw them in a container one year to get that fourth year in for, for that. Um, but yeah, growing potatoes in containers can be challenging, but keep the roots cool, keep them well watered, and uh, that, that keep the containers on the large size too. So if you've got a, a raised bed, you can do potatoes in a section and then that won't count as having used that whole bed for potatoes? Potentially, but if you're gonna use the next section for next year, don't make it the one directly adjacent on the length of that raised bed. So if you're on one end, skip to the other end the following year, mm -hmm. and then maybe that's the next year you go into the container, then in the center of the bed. So, I mean, it's a lot of, it's a shell yeah. game, <laughs> shuffling <laughs> things around. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good idea to rotate potatoes just because okay. of the soil borne disease that can build up. 
Okay, Jen, I know you grow potatoes. Anything you'd like to share? Uh, I agree with everything Chris is saying. Um, you might want to consider even more raised beds. And so if dividing it is causing a lot of um, challenge to you and, you know, okay, you need, that's one great excuse to build more, more garden space, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I I personally don't grow potatoes as much as I used to because I have had a lot of problems with uh, mice and mice digging them up and eating them. So <laughs> at least somebody got to enjoy them, right? Yeah, the ongoing the ongoing wars with wildlife. Nice, nice. Okay, we're going to question number thirty-two. This one's for Jen. Uh, this one is from Angela. She writes at the beginning of March. I bought a, a young Chicago hardy fig tree. It has developed brown crispy splotches on most of the leaves. Is it still, or I'm sorry, it is still growing perfectly fine. Are these splotches a disease? Did it get stressed um, and is now growing out of it? Any insight you would provide would be appreciated. So what are you thinking? And I, oh, I see it on that top sort of left leaf there. What do you think? I think, I'm, well, a couple of questions I have that I can try to address. I wondered if she had put it outside at all. It, in March, we had some warm days, but if it had not been acclimated outside, that could just be effects of the wind and sun. But uh, potted fig will have some issues with uh, too much moisture will cause some bacterial spots on the leaves. It's usually nothing um, too serious as long as you address the moisture issue. We see it a lot on uh, fiddle leaf fig, which is that super popular house plant we keep seeing everywhere. Uh, but um, Chicago fig is actually hardy. Um, it's hardy at least in zone five, I think a little lower too. We had it growing up, we had one in our garden and I have one in my garden now. Uh, so it is possible um, to plant it outdoors. Uh, the problem is, is that it will, it's kind of like that hydrangea question we seem to get all the time. But it has to um, flower and fruit on old wood, and so most of the time around here, the, the stems above ground get killed to the to the ground, um, and they do regenerate. But um, something that might be fun for uh, viewers to check out: there's a website called the Italian Garden Project. It's the ItalianGardenProject.com. They have a whole like you can go down this immense rabbit hole of fig growing. And a lot of Italian immigrants brought fig trees from Italy along with them. And they grew them um, and overwintered them and produced fruit. Um, there's all kinds of methods. We've tried some of them um, where you have to like wrap them. Some people will um, bend them down and mulch them for the winter to protect those um, stems wow. above the ground. But if that's kind of a, a rabbit hole you wanna, wanna try, <laughs> um, why not? <laughs> Do you have the time to invest in this rabbit yeah. hole? <laughs> right. There's some that you can, I have never heard of anyone, uh, I don't know why you couldn't grow Chicago Hardy just as a potted house plant. They will tend to lose their leaves indoors in the winter time. Mm -hmm. But as long as you can remember to water them maybe once a month, then by spring they start sprouting again. But there's, there's lots of other varieties that um, are not hardy in zone five that you can, um, Keep growing as a house plant. And once you've had a uh, fresh fig, um, if you've never had one, um, you'll understand why people are going to all this trouble to try and get the fruit from them because they're just no comparison to the dry. I don't think I've had a fresh one. So now I'll be on the hunt. All right. See if I can get the experience. So if you're watching, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm soliciting. Send them in. <laughs> yeah, send them in. Send them in. Okay, another question. Uh, this one's about uh, pest number 33 from Anthony Becker. Every year I have squash borers, I think he says, um, that often wilt the plants and kill most of the vines as well as squash bugs that drain them. Some years I'm physically able to kill most of them, but I'm a quadriplegic and have limited access to the plants. I've tried several pesticides like seven, but do not see much that phases them. This year I'm trying a BT spray for the borers, but I'm wondering if the team knows the best effective treatment for borers, squash bugs, and since I'm asking, cabbage butterflies. So that's a loaded question. Let's see if we can break it all down. Um, control for squash and stink bugs, and then uh, the cabbage at the end. I, I can say that for me, the best control I have found was by accident. I planted my squash way later than usual. So I missed that window when the, the um, borers and the squash bugs are really actively looking for squash. 
Now, is that now? Are we in that time now? I've planted, I planted my squash like in late May or June. Okay. And that was really beneficial to me. Okay, and Chris, anything from, oh, sorry, Jen, I didn't mean to cut okay. you off. I thought you were done. Um, anything from you, Chris, on, on that? But uh, squash vine borer is one of those that can make someone quit gardening altogether because you have <laughs> these big, beautiful squash vines and then overnight they seem to wilt. Um, so I think they said what they were thinking of using a BT spray. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. They wanted to. That's correct. Okay. So you could try to apply BT, which is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's uh, it's an organic product that only targets caterpillars. Now the the squash vine borer, the larval stage, is a caterpillar. Um, it's a clear wing moth, I believe, uh, and she'll lay her eggs at the base of that squash plant and the egg will hatch and then the larva tunnels into the plant stem and just goes to town eating away and then it kills all the tissue and, you know, wilts your plant. Uh, and it goes pretty much unnoticed until the plant wilts. Um, so I think the idea here is you put BT on there. So as that larva tunnels into the stem, uh, it might kill it. Now that seems a little bit unlikely that it might work, but it's possible. I'm not going to rule out the possibility of it working. Um, I have seen people try like physical exclusion, like paper towel rolls, things like that, aluminum foil. That hasn't always worked either. Um, you know, it, a lot of times people will call the office after the fact, so their vines wilted, what do they do? Um, well, what you can do is a little bit of surgery. Uh, you can take a sharp knife or a paper clip, unfold it, and actually go in there and remove that caterpillar, that, that boring caterpillar from inside the stem. Uh, you pull that out and then uh, you would then mound up some, some topsoil or compost there on the wounded area, give it plenty of water, uh, and hopefully the plant might be able to uh, send roots out and, uh, and, and then hopefully reestablish itself. But again, the odds are not always in your favor. So I like uh, Jennifer's suggestion, staggering out your planting date is a good way. Some plants might get it, but then the others won't. Okay. And same advice for the uh, cabbage. He wrote in cabbage butterflies. Will the BT be effective on that as well? It, it will. Yeah. So they're probably thinking cabbage moth or cabbage looper. And one thing I love about most of their cabbage crops, you know, our kale and things like that we grow, we don't have to worry about them flowering. So if you really want, you could just put some type of insect netting over top to physically exclude these altogether and just avoid the pesticide. Mm -hmm. oh, another good idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Um, and finally, we don't have any other questions today to answer, but we have gotten some emails asking questions. Everyone is anxiously anticipating the arrival of the cicada. And so, um, Chris, you had mentioned that there were some, some chatter going on in other counties, but if you guys could just take this last three or four minutes and, uh, just kind of tell people what to expect. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are just wanting to know what to be ready for. Um, will this harm anything in their garden? So just run us down the list of what we can expect with these cicadas. And Jen, we'll go, we'll start with you. Go ahead. Um, I would say to think about uh, if you're wanting to guess whether you're going to have a ton of cicadas on your property, uh, look at the age of the trees in the area. So anything that was around 17 years ago, you pretty likely to have um, cicadas. I live adjacent to a county uh, forest preserve. So there's lots of big old growth trees. So I, if, if they come out near me, there's probably gonna be quite a few of them. If you're in a new subdivision with trees that are recently planted, it's probably not gonna be as big of a deal, but you may have some that fly in. They do move, they don't just stay in one place. Okay, all right. Um, and Chris, can we, you know, is, do we need to be concerned about our, our vegetables, our flowers? You know, what, what will they do damage? Will they do harm to anything? You know, and, and unfortunately, in my neck of the woods, now I like insects. I think they're fun and fascinating. Unfortunately, where I'm at in West Central Illinois, I'm not going to get them. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I know, Tanisha, you're probably at ground you zero can trade. in Illinois. Great. Yeah, so you're... <laughs> So your vegetables, probably a lot of your perennials, they should be fine. The big damage occurs when the female, she likes to lay her egg in the kind of the, the twigs, kind of the ends of uh, the branch tips of trees. And so she cuts a slit in that branch and she lays her egg in there. And then when you get like hundreds of them doing that, suddenly you have a tree exhibiting the symptoms of flagging. That's what we call it. So the, the tips of the branches actually die. Mm. Um, and so then the, the tree has this flagging effect. 
And that's the damage that happens. And that's when people will, will call in and be like, what's happening to my trees? All the branch tips have died back. So that's what, what's probably the main issue happening. And then now. the noise. Let's talk about the noise. <laughs> <laughs> because you both use the word deafening. So we've got about a minute left. Um, what can we expect volume wise, depending on where you are? Well, if you need a white noise machine at night, you're probably not going to need it while the uh, cicadas are out. Wow, that loud, huh? Mm -hmm. And how long I, will this last? Yeah, the, so we've, we've gotten reports of emergence already in southern counties of, of Illinois. Um, and I mean, so it should be getting started when the nights start staying warm. And as far as I know, I think they go up through August, if that's correct, Jennifer, if that's a, I don't know if they're a frost insect, but they go throughout the I don't significant remember. part of the summer. Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's it's a significant amount of time. Oh yeah. boy. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely talk more about this in the coming weeks as we uh, find out where they are. And I'm sure our viewers will let us know if they're seeing them at their house. But thank you guys so much. Uh, great show. Lots of great information. Appreciate you. And thank you so much for watching. We appreciate you. If you have any questions for us, uh, you can send us an email to yourgarden at gmail.com. And always, you can uh, find us on Instagram and Facebook. Just search Mid America Gardener. And we will see you next time. Good night.